Good afternoon and welcome to KAUS Live. My name is Michelle Ponto from KAUS Communications and I'm here today with Dr. Thomas Bosch from the Zoological Institute in Kiel University who has been a guest at KAUS for a couple days and you've been here before, haven't you? Right, yeah. Nice. Well, welcome back. Thank you very much. And you were here this time, you were giving a special talk to some of our SRSI students at the university. That's great, yes. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit about this? Yeah, so it all came about uh, with novel technologies. And uh, so I'm an evolutionary developmental biology for some time and uh, trying to understand basic developmental mechanisms and uh, fundamental principles of life. And um, the novel technologies came around, like deep sequencing technologies. Um, we realized that any kind of animal and plant and human tissue is stably associated with uh, a myriad of microbes uh, containing bacteria, viruses, uh, fungi, and others. And uh, by looking a little deeper into that, uh, we realized that in many cases these are co-evolved communities. So there is a species specificity, a given host, let's say a coral or a sponge or an insect, has a given uh, microbial composition. And uh, so that was early findings and interesting. And if that's stable, then it indicates that the host, the coral polyp or the sponge, or the human tissue has interest to keep that particular microbial community. And then the second insight came when uh, we realizing that when you disturb that community, that then this host tissue is not doing very well. And in human cases, we have evidence now that when you disturb this community uh, of many different organisms together, what we call a meta-organism, then you develop complex diseases. And uh, some of them are very dominant in these days. Um, I remember on adipositas, on inflammatory bowel diseases, on uh, neurodegenerative diseases, and, and, and others. And uh, because with some therapies, including fecal microbial transplantation, you at least in some patients and in some cases can linder the symptoms. And since in this fecal microbial transplantation, nothing else is there but microbial products, we strongly believe that this multi-organismic association of our cells and the microbial cells is the naturally evolved stable condition of life and that our modern condition of living, many different factors, not only nutrients, many different, are very heavily affecting this connection and causes what we call dysbiosis. And that may be the reason for the disease. And in the coral world, there is coral bleaching, which my colleague, uh, Professor Volstra, and others are studying very heavily. We think these are real complex problems. But studying meta-organisms is the only way to, to, to approach that complexity and uh, to get to a deeper understanding of these interactions. So we are made up with not just, we're not just one solid species. We are made up of many, many, many different. So, sorry to say, but you are 90% microbial. Uh, you have at least the same number of bacteria cell always with you. Then you have your own, your own body cells, and uh, so that's. But only being together makes you, in evolutionary terms, fit or healthy. So we think that um, health is always multi-organismic. And if you break down that partnership between us and the many microbes in our gut, on our skin, any organ, then you develop problems. So with these, are these connected with genes in any way, or is the genes that the 10% that's actually me and the rest of it is coming from everything else that's yeah, inside thank you. of me? An excellent question. Genes are, of course, uh, important and of course uh, your genes and the host genes are contributing to the fitness of the meta-organism but the microbes also bring their own genes 
And uh, so they contribute. And uh, once we did an analysis of the human genome and looking for traces of microbial genes in the human micro uh, genome, and we came up, and that is published in PNAS some years ago, with 37% of our genome can be directly traced back to our microbes. So we even have to think in the terms of genetic world in a much more broader way. And uh, so there is a term around which is, you can replace the word meta-organism with holobiont. And then an Israeli couple um, brought up a new theory on evolution, which they call the hologenome theory, by assuming that the genes and the, 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 the summary of the genes of the different bacteria in us, together with our genes, make the hologenome. And that's what is really then the driving force in a meta-organism. You mentioned that these um, these things are evolving over time. Do, can they evolve over a time, a lifespan, rather than years and years and years and decades? For mm -hmm. example, can I be born with one set, but if I move or other things are introduced into my environment, will my will my um, what did you call it? Holland? Microbes. Will, will mm -hmm. they change? Yeah. Thank you very much. It's an excellent question. The answer is a clear yes. So we have. Um, what we call a core microbiome, which will not change. And American colleagues, uh, Howard Ochman and others, have very nicely proven um, that there is a homo sapiens, a human-specific microbiome, which distinguishes us from, for example, the great apes, our closest ancestors. However, if you start to travel, uh, then your microbes, of course, will change depending on the diet and the lifestyle and uh, in, in the different regions and the earth where you are. So there is a dynamic to that. And there is a second dynamic which goes on during our lifespan. We are born and we assume still that the babies, the human babies are born sterile. I put that a little bit in a question mark because there seem to get doubts on that already. And then if the baby grows up, it goes through puberty and then adult and then getting old, the microbe changes with time. Now that may sound as well, you know, this is just correlation and uh, if I get old, my microbiome gets also old. However, there seems to be a striking functional component involved and this came from recent work by a colleague at the Max Planck in Cologne working on a model organism on a very fast, short-living fish. And uh, what this team has shown in a paper in eLife last year is if you transplant a young microbiome from a, a microbiome from a young fish into a very old fish, which has lost the color and looks like we are getting old, this old fish gets younger by measurable parameters, so it getting more active and so on and so on. So that implies that we have a core microbiome, but then we have also a microbiome set in addition to that, which changes with time during our lifespan, and it may have deep function for each period of these different life stages. And uh, so I think it's an exciting future um, for the young generation to find out what are the molecules involved and how do the microbes affect us and can microbes make us younger? That's very interesting. It's, it's definitely going to be a topic for the future. People are always wanting to know how they sure. can turn back time. Sure. Uh, for the for the microbes, you mentioned there there was some discussion about how the the babies are could come out sterile, but that might not be the case. What happens in the other way? Say, for example, right now there's there's microbes everywhere, and I could be picking them up as I travel. What if I went into a sterile environment? Do they need to be in an environment where they can rejuvenate or, or um, get the get what they need to survive? Can I kill them off by accident? Oh yes, uh, you can of course kill them off and that's not good for you. I mean, um, but one of the, mm, the progresses and the breakthroughs in the field was first was sequencing. 
making the invisible because we don't see them. And I always get asked, well, what are you talking about? I, I have no microbes. Yes, you, sure you have, but you cannot see them. And only these technologies made them visible. So making the invisible visible. Novel technology here at Kaus, you also have a fantastic facility of doing this. But the second breakthrough was make model systems, animals and plants, what we call germ-free, free of bacteria. And you can do that by different means, antibiotics, germ-free mouse facility, very expensive but very informative, takes little mouse babies out by cesarean section from the, pregnant, from the mouse mother and then pops them up and grows them, these little mouse babies, in a sterile cage. and. Uh, they reach then adulthood, they get sexually mature, and then they start to reproduce. And so this is a wonderful population of animals which have no, no single bacteria. It's completely sterile. And then you can, of course, f study the function of the bacteria. Because, first of all, you can compare this germ-free animal with a normal animal, and you can see what is similar and what is different. But you also can then introduce into these uh, germ-free animals, you can introduce specific and distinct microbial species, and you can see does that lead to molecular, biochemical, behavior, physiological changes in that. So that's, uh, that's what the researcher does in the lab. Unfortunately, what, what we are doing every day is we do every day disturb our partnership with the microbes, and in particular because of antibiotics. That's one of the major crises in the Western world, and uh, my colleague Martin Blazer has written, he's studying that since many years, and uh, has written a fantastic book, The Missing Microbes. And it's not the antibiotics which you get prescribed from your doctor. It's the antibiotics which are not visible in our food, in our daily life. Um, there is no large-scale aquaculture, agriculture, farming, uh, which gets uh, to a point without antibiotics. And uh, if you now believe what I've said before, that we are nothing but a multi-organismic association with billions of microbes, badly needed for our physiological functioning, then you can imagine what happens if we take our daily dose of antibiotics and for in the long run what we do is we deplete our microbes and we particularly deplete the diversity of the microbes. And we now know that many of the disease states of these so-called complex diseases or inflammatory diseases, inflammation, are always associated with a decrease in diversity of the microbes. So that also, of course, opens a window for the future. When we have realized that that's the case, we have A, to understand what's the precise function and interaction of the microbes with us, and how do we interact with the microbes. But then, we also have to somehow turn around and come, there's a term where colleagues call these type of diseases, which I talked about, nature deficit diseases. And yesterday evening to the young students, I propose that we have to go from these nature deficit disorders because we do everything unnatural. We are living the indoor generation. 90% of our time we spend indoor. That's not very healthy. We eat things which maybe we shouldn't eat, and but we only eat because we feed our microbes, and we eat the things which the microbes really don't really like, which are co-evolved with us. So I think we have to turn from these nature deficit disorders to a nature-enriched lifestyle. and. That goes from diets to outdoor activities to reducing amount of antibiotics what we are taking into and to considering that nature and the basic functioning of life is a web, it's a network, it's a multi-organismic association, it's a meta-organism and this is complex interactions but if we do not in, in, uh, if we do not appreciate them, um, we may develop into more diseases which we do not want.
So you mentioned the microbes, the things that we eat affect them. Do they need other things, for example, oxygen? So if you exercise more, do they get more oxygen? Is it mm -hmm. so everything you do mm -hmm. or put in your body is mm -hmm. what keeps them healthy as well? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so I'm not a I'm not a so certainly the food is something which affects microbes very much and. Most of the research currently is a focus on the microbes in the gut. Yeah, so because we, we carry, people calculated about two kilograms of microbes of our body weight are actually the microbes only in our intestine. But since we have microbes everywhere on our skin and on our inner organs, there is no organ which is really sterile. So th there is much more, of course, which affects the healthiness and the well-being. And uh, if you ask precisely on the physical activities, I think uh, this mostly benefits, first of all, the host cells, so your cells. But if your cells are fine, then all the biochemistry and the signaling and the communication with the associated microbes also functions very well. So there is more an indirect effect than on, on, on these things. And yeah. Okay. So you mentioned that um, with the human body, what we eat and, and the, it can help or hinder the, the, the microbes. How about things that are like corals where they're, they're, they can't move around so it's what is coming on them or what is passing by them is affecting the microbes. How are they being affected by the changes that are happening in the world with the way the oceans are changing, with the way, um, uh, with climate change, with the sun? How are they being? How are their microbes being affected? Mm -hmm. So, these uh, marine organisms are heavily affected. They are more or less completely unprotected. I mean, we can do something uh, to protect ourselves, uh, but these creatures have no external skeleton. Uh, they have a mucus layer, and this mucus layer is full of microbes, and then, then there is an empty tissue, more or less. So they are heavily infected, and. If you now believe in this meta-organism concept and in this web of life, uh, then you can imagine that any disturbance of the surrounding environment in terms of nutrients or temperatures or CO2 or something affects at least parts of this multi-organismic association. And, it, and if it affects one part, the whole system is affected. It's a modular system. So there are many modules being together and they form the functioning meta-organism. So if you have a dramatic detrimental effect or impact on one of the modules, um, this certainly affects the whole. So that's why corals are particularly sensitive um, to that and they are not very well equipped to fight against that. Uh, modern research, including research at Kaust uh, University and also in the, in the group of uh, Professor Folstra, uh, is trying to understand what are mechanisms, how to adapt um, to that changing environment, and um, can corals adapt to the changing environment, or do we have to do something with the environment to protect the corals? The, pro the problem is huge, and it's particular uh, obvious, not so much in the Red Sea, which is a very sheltered and a wonderful place of natural of nature, but if you go to the Great Barrier Reef and, and, and on, the, on the coast of Australia and you fly there with a helicopter or you go then diving, you see there's square kilometers of square kilometers of white corals. This is coral bleaching, and it's certainly a disturbance of the meta-organisms, a uh, coral, and. Uh, but we are far from understanding what's really going on. It's a complex relationship between the corals, between the algae, which are the photobionts, and with all these microbes, which are, as I said, not only bacteria. They include also fungi, they include viruses, they include archaea, so many different small invisible creatures. and. Um, but as I said, health is multi-organismic, and if you want to do something also for corals, we have to understand the multi-organismic associations. And uh, novel technology certainly helps, um, but we also need a new thinking. We need the thinking that complexity is the reality, and to approach complexity, 
we need interdisciplinary approaches. I'm employing mathematicians, biocomputational colleagues. Uh, at the moment, I'm working very closely with an anthropologist and philosopher to, under, to approach these complex issues. And that was also the lesson yesterday to the students here at KAUST. Um, we have to train the young generation in interdisciplinary thinking. The young biologists must be able to talk to the biocomputational uh, expert and the robot robotics uh, freak must be able to listen to the biologists. And if they can do that, they together can, may can come up with new ideas how to understand a huge problem like an inflammatory disease in humans or like coral bleaching. That's right. Yeah, it's true. It's very interesting. Everything is crossing over. That's the point. Yeah, yeah that's the point. I'm hesitating, or I, I was hesitating, but uh, I'm not hesitating anymore to take the word holistic approaches in my, in my mouth. And I think um, we forgot the complexity. I refer to a fantastic old researcher, Alexander von Humboldt, who in 1820 or something wrote The Cosmos and other after his long traveling around the world. And Humboldt was one of the very first who saw the complexity and he coined the term web of life. And uh, because he saw that everything, plants and animals and humans and nature, everything is connected. And if you disturb at one, one of these modules, then the whole thing suffers. Nothing else is what we are facing every day today. The only difference is that we start to get a more deeper understanding of the changed interactions and in particular we have now technology at hand to really look deep into this complexity. But it's challenging. We have to leave uh, and to give up any boundaries, borders, departments, you know, and we need this combined approach. Um, but I'm hopeful uh, that um, with that we will get to a deep understanding um, particular of this dysbiosis and maybe in the future there may be even ways uh, where we can exploit the power of microbes. Obviously they produce a lot of things which are very beneficial for us and uh, so if you only understand what are they doing and um, let's think about small molecules and if we can even synthesize the small molecules Maybe that's the new generation of probiotics, and uh, that's a fascinating new world, and I think it's also economically very interesting. There's a beginning generation of junior researchers who are doing, thinking of startup companies, mm -hmm. of exploiting that, that knowledge. And uh, so, yes, we are living in very exciting times. I was reading on your website um, that you do a lot of science communication out to the general public. Mm -hmm. Why, why is that? I know you guys are still doing the research beyond this. Why is it important to, to already start communicating this out and getting people to understand? Thank you very much for that question. I don't get it too often. and uh, I think it's, uh, of course, I'm a scientist. I'm a basic researcher. I'm trying to understand fundamental problems in maybe not important animal systems, but which may give us informative clues about what's going on in life. But I think understanding what's going on in a normal life process is important for everybody, not only for me. So I feel it's my duty and my responsibility that I talk about that, so that I want that other people can participate in what we are doing and appreciating, particularly if it comes to health issues. I think if you think about that, I mean, Saudi Arabia, Western Europe, I mean, we have 30 to 40 percent adipositas people. I think it's important to tell people that we get clues about the, 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 the background behind. And it's not that we eat too much. It's th the problem is that we eat the wrong thing. And uh, you have to educate. Because I know what's going on. I think I have to tell other people as well. That's one side of the coin. Then if you start to do that, you realize that's not an easy business. And uh, every, co every community you talk to is very different. I'm talking to the elder generation. Uh, I've talked to school children. We talk to non-educated general public. Uh, so everything is different. So you have to do it a little bit more professional. So uh, we work together with professional science communicators. 
we realize that what we are doing is hardly ever for a normal person comprehensible. So we work together with artists, with designers, to make this not understandable sequence uh, data understandable by transforming it into a picture, which all of a sudden everybody can understand what I'm talking about. So, uh, and when we talk to school children, we want to find out which way is efficient to bring complex issues over. So I'm working together with an academic institute uh, where we do research. We have a, 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 a small children paper. Uh, ich bin, I am Meta. It's a comic and uh, uh, developed by a gifted uh, postdoc, Yasmin Appelhans. And uh, with this new, uh, comic paper, we go to schools and then we do research to the school children which read that newspaper after they get a questionnaire. Are they able to answer the question better? In the compared class is then the class of kids which have not seen that comic paper. And by doing this, we try to learn what's an efficient way of talking to the public. But equally important for me personally is every time I'm talking to somebody outside my research, my academic community, I learn for myself. I learned last night so much from these young kids. And uh, this is a two-way road, and I, I have fun uh, to talk about what we are doing, but I'm also listening, and I'm incorporating that, what I get, and that again feeds into maybe what we do tomorrow in the lab. So that's all. I think uh, science is also communicating with other people, and one of the skills of which we have to train to young people um, um, potential researchers is you have to be communicative, you have to be able to talk, otherwise you can be as brilliant as you want to be, but your science will not get the attention it deserves. That's very interesting, and it makes sense. If, you're, if you need to communicate to everybody outside of your own peer group, this is how you're going to get that cross-discipline impact that you're looking for. Yeah. We have time for just a couple more questions. Sure. I'm curious about your talk last night and the kind of questions the students were asking you. You said that they asked very interesting questions and you had kind of alluded to that they talked about AI and other things and I'm, I'm wondering how they got from microbes to AI. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I was surprised as well, but it was a very relaxed. Uh, so the setting was that um, uh, Saudi Arabia government has obviously a program of selecting um, gifted uh, high school students and they provide them with support from the coast here, provide them with all kind of different possibilities to further getting educated and one of this is this program which I took part last night and uh, so they can then invite uh, distinguished speakers from outside and uh, I spent, I, I had dinner with them and after that and uh, I gave a talk and after, and after the talk there was then questions and, 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 and so on. And um, I mean if you do that often this is a pretty normal part of your life but if you then all of a sudden realize my goodness they they hang on your lips and they they really understand what you're talking uh, and you're not just giving a message over but they they understand and uh, if I talk about the close association between the microbes and the human or the animals and then you get a question then you know how much is human and how much is microbe or another question was, um, can we get an artificial human by just artificially designing new microbes, bringing that into the human, and does the humanness change? That's a fantastic question because uh, we know that human behavior, anxiety, for example, is heavily influenced on the microbes, and we know that from animal studies. Uh, people talk about the gut-brain axis, and uh, so there is a certain influence of microbial products on our behavior. So the students immediately picked that up and transferred that and asked them the, the second generation question, if that's the case, can we change the human? That was one of the, the, the questions. The other question which I found, among many of interesting questions, which I found really fascinating and telling me they understood what I was talking about, uh, they all of a sudden started about asking, what's about epigenetic? 
I didn't take that word in my in my lecture because I thought, you know, for high school students, I don't want to go to too much specialized wording. But one of the young ladies uh, asked about that, and I said, "Wow, um, of course, epigenetic is what we think the uh, the mediator between the environment and how." The, the genetic code reacts to the environment. And you can uh, biochemically modify the genetic code, the DNA, by um, different biochemical processes. And we know the machinery, we know the enzymes. So these kids obviously realized, well, there is this known fact about epigenetics. But now this professor talks about the microbes. So what's the connection? And of course, that's one of the, the very recent and, and timely research questions which we are at the moment trying to address. How, does the, how is the epigenetic machinery um, linked to the environment, which can be microbes, can also be temperature, and many other things. And um, so, uh, yes, that was, a very, uh, that was a very joyful and, uh, and, and a rewarding evening with this, with this young uh, kids. And I, I really uh, congratulate uh, the responsible organizers for A, selecting such a group of people and also to supporting this type of thing. It's, it's just wonderful. I'm glad you had a good time. The, the students here always surprise me, whether they're coming from KGSB or SRSI or our graduate students that we have. They always come up with amazing questions or mm -hmm. yeah. they're so yeah. passionate to learn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're out of time, but if anybody has any more questions or wants to learn more, you do have a very good website because that's where I found a lot of your stuff. And I found it through just uh, through Google, through um, Googling the Institute of, of um, or the Zoological Institute at Kiel. And if you guys go there, you will find stuff about his science communication things. There were, there were slides and posters, PowerPoints. There was a video. There's a lot of different information on that website. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. No problem. And for those of you who are tuning in virtually, make sure you follow the Cows social media platforms, the Twitter and Facebook, to find out who our next guest will be. And until then, have a great afternoon. Thank you.